Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Pentax Medical's online event, Enhancing Endoscopy Hygiene Guidelines for Improved Patient Outcomes. What are the next steps? You just saw Pentax Medical's training center in Hamburg, which is brand new, and obviously we would have loved to invite you over there, but due to corona measures all over the globe, also here in the studio, which we adhere to very strictly, um, it wasn't possible to invite you there, but we thank you very much for joining us here today online. My name is Ingmar de Goyer, and I'll be moderating the panel discussion that we will have in the next two hours. This is the second time that I'm allowed to do something. Last year, we were in Pentax Medical's Augsburg Center, where we had some very interesting discussions also with various experts about how can we reduce the risk of infection in endoscopy. This year, we're also going to focus on that, but now we're going to look specifically at those enhanced hygiene guidelines. As last year, we're going to try to come to some very concrete uh, recommendations and next steps so that we can really get to some, somewhere new and better, as that is obviously the objective of Pentax Medical's event. Um, it's going to be live broadcasted on YouTube, this event. You'll also see it through the event page, and we're going to be recording this event, so just that you, aware, that you are aware of that. Um, in this session, where you're going to see the panel discussions, we're going to have four very interesting speakers who are going to give a very short presentation of about 12 minutes um, where they're going to look at a specific perspective to how we can improve these patient outcomes. Um, after the 12 minute presentation, I'm gonna ask them a couple of questions and then we go to the next one. After all four speakers have been on, uh, on air, we're then gonna come back here and, as a joint panel discussion and there we're gonna just discuss a few things to really come to a mutual understanding of where we should move ahead with patient outcomes and enhancing endoscopy hygiene guidelines. Now. You can already start asking your questions if you feel free to do so. On the right-hand corner, in the bottom, in the red box, you can there answer or ask and put some comments in there that we're going to use at the end of the session where we kept 30 minutes free to really um, drive through your questions and ask them to the relevant speakers here. Um, because we have more than 400 people online now watching this event, and we also know that they're from different regions around the globe, just a small note to uh, be clear that the presenters will mostly look at the topics from a European perspective, but because we all know that knowledge and technology is a very global thing, so we're very sure that this is also relevant for those parts outside of Europe. So again, thank you very much for joining, and let me now introduce to you the four speakers in order of presentation. So the first speaker is going to be Marion de Pater Godhelp. She's president of SGINA, which is the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy Nurses Association. She's currently the head nurse endoscopy in the Amsterdam University Medical Center in the Netherlands, and she will be focusing on the role of human factor in optimal reprocessing outcomes. The second speaker is Professor Marco Bruno, who's the head of Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology in the Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and he will be speaking on the burden of an outbreak due to contaminated endoscopes. The third speaker is Professor Didier Le Pelletier, who is the head of hygiene department at the University Hospital of Nantes in France, and he's going to focus on the importance of drying, where the reduction of biofilm formation with the use of plasma typhoon and plasma bag. Last but certainly not least, we have Paul César, who works at Pentax Medical EMEA as reprocessing and infection control leader who will be focusing on the importance of training as a core competency. So without further ado, I would like to just now go um, online because we have two speakers here in the studio. We have Marco Bruno and Paul Cesar over here. And online we have Marion de Pater and Professor Le Pelletier. And I would now love to give the word to Marion de Pater, who's going to speak about the role of the human factor in securing an optimal reprocessing outcome. Marion. Thank you very much for your uh, nice uh, introduction and thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, especially during these uh, COVID-19 uh, times, 
it's nice to have the opportunity uh, to have an online meeting with uh, with a great uh, group of people. So I will uh, talk about the role of the human factor in securing an optimal reprocessing outcome uh, during this uh, 10, uh, 12 minutes. So first of all, the SGNA is ESGE guidelines. It's last published in 2018, and uh, this is a position statement set standards for the reprocessing of flexible endoscopes and endoscopic devices used in gastroenterology. So it's related to PubMed articles, uh, bibliographies or uh, of identified articles, and also a recommendation of experts. But um, of course, um, have we, uh, we see that we need some more uh, controlled clinical studies um, to clarify some aspects in the guideline, especially if we look at uh, the uh, culture of the endoscopes. And the guideline is intended to be an educational tool. So um, if we look at infections, uh, can we say that endoscopy in associated infections are rare and unimportant? So if, if we look a little bit uh, uh, closer to the device we use for endoscopy, uh, it, we know that it is a semi-critical device. Uh, it is a complex design with narrow lumens and multiple uh, internal channels. It's difficult to clean and disinfect and also easily to damage. And it can be heavily uh, contaminated with body fluids, blood and microorganisms. And uh, we all know that we make a movement from diagnosis uh, in endoscopy to intervention. So uh, we have to deal with more uh, fluid in the endoscope, and more accessories do through the endoscope. So we've seen that in 1970s, we, uh, had, there are some reports about endoscopy associated infections. And we see that the, there was no, no a non-compliance with the guideline. So an inadequate pre-cleaning cleaning, disinfections, and the drying and storage problem, and also uh, of endoscopes and accessories. And we also see that we have to deal with a design limitation. So uh, especially the valves and the distal ends, uh, it's, it's really difficult to reprocess. And we've seen some damages and failure of the water disinfections. So there is a risk of transmission from infection from one patient to another. And uh, especially in the year of 2012, there uh, came a report from the United States that there was really a patient-to-patient -patient transmission, uh, transmission of the um, uh, MDROs. And the, the transmission links was uh, especially related to the elevated channel of the endoscope. So the ERCP scope is also the EOS linear scope. And we see it contamination um, of the elevated cable and also the cable channel. And that was uh, a, spe a special news on CNN in the United States. And uh, that gave us um, a special regulation uh, uh, to the reprocessing of our endoscope. So um, we've seen an increasing number of infection with multi-resistant organisms, so VOE, um, uh, so um, uh, MDRO, uh, I already mentioned. Uh, have we seen more multimorbid patients and we perform more invasive and complex diagnosis and therapies with our endoscopes. So maybe we underestimated the risk of infections because it is really difficult to, uh, to, uh, uh, to make the link to endoscopy uh, because the patients have more, most of the time multiple treatments. So where is the source? And also a surveillance and follow-up after endoscopy is difficult, especially for the outpatients. And the rates of infections and re related complications are really difficult to evaluate. So the pathogens usually are defined as enteric flora and the low, long lag time between the colonization infection and the low frequency of infection makes it very difficult. And so do we only see the tip of the iceberg? So if we go in more detail, how many minutes does it take to manually clean a duodenoscope properly? Is it five minutes, 50 minutes, or is it 25 minutes? Cleaning should take 25 minutes. And the average time that spent was only 6.5 minutes. 
So then we realize that we have really a problem. And when we look a little bit more in the detail uh, to the reprocessing, we first always start with the manual cleaning. And now we all know that it is really an important step in prevention of transmission, but also prevents a biofilm in the endoscope. So when the endoscope is coming out of the patient, the bedside cleaning has all, um, uh, the, 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 uh, especially the bedside cleaning is really important. So uh, flush the endoscope with the water with detergent is, is really important. And that's uh, minimize the chance of biofilm. Then the transport of the endoscope, is it within 30 minutes or it takes it uh, two hours to bring it to the disinfection area? And there is a, a, a time uh, pressure. And then you bring it to the disinfection area. The bursting uh, is really important. Uh, it was in disinfection uh, process, but also the drying and the storage uh, of the endoscope is important. And uh, when we look and then for training and the compliance. Um, oh, sorry. Something happens in my presentation. Excuse me. Um, so appropriate training and compliance with the manufacturer is really uh, uh, important and special attention to the elevator. So uh, using an optimal lighting and the use of the magnification is really important. And then we look at the steps for the duodenum scope, we count 130 steps uh, for cleaning. So the human factor is, is in this uh, process uh, really important. And um, have we've done a survey around Europe with SGINA uh, um, uh, to find out um, uh, what, the, what the human factor is in, in, in these special cases. And then we see that there is a lack of access to uh, understand the, the, uh, the manufacturer's validated instruction of reprocessing. And the manual is not uh, so easy to read because not most of the times it is a book of several pages. And uh, so uh, we, have, we have to do something in teaching of the people. There is a lack of knowledge or unfamiliarity with the endoscope channels, accessories and reprocessing devices. And uh, of course, we have to deal with an inadequate number of staff to support the volume and the workflow and smooth out. And we've seen a frequent disruption of interruptions during the reprocessing and also the training is in inadequate, limited accountability, and sometimes a lack of mindfulness and underestimated of risk. And the time pressure here when we have to, to deal with a shortage of endoscopes uh, for a rapid turnaround uh, they ask uh, to, to go on with all these steps. It's easily to uh, forget a step or uh, uh, to, to, to take that step uh, to, to do not brush or a leakage test or whatever. So it's easily, the, uh, it, it, it's a human factor. So it's, it's easy to make a mistake uh, and that makes it really difficult. And when we look at the qualification and competencies, we have to deal with knowledge, experience, and skills, but also the right attitudes. Uh, and we have to deal with the staff under the 30 years, but also to deal with the staff uh, above the 30 years. So everyone is, dif is different. And it's necessary then to make a structured training, uh, to, uh, to have a, a regular audits, but also audits in the teams. Uh, that, that you look uh, uh, to your colleague, uh, who is making all these steps. Refreshing these courses are really important. So following the current guidelines, ensure a safe scope. That's what we want. But if we look at some reports, we, we are surprised that, that, that you, you find uh, um, this, this audit, this GCI audit, that, there are, uh, that the people were skipping steps and uh, doing them very poorly and also the Ofsted study uh, reports show that there was fluid uh, detected in the endoscope and there was uh, contaminated bronchoscopes. So, yeah, um, again, the human factor is really important. And then when we look at the guidelines, uh, we've seen that the FDA advice uh, um, a double reprocessing of duodenum scope, a uniform of surveillance with the use of culture and, and whole policy. 
And we need an extensive training of staff um, involved in the reprocessing is really a mandatory. And the ESG guideline says, okay, we have to deal with a, a, a number of sufficient, sufficient uh, trained, dedicated, competent uh, uh, staff. And the staff uh, needs uh, uh, sufficient time. And we need a formal training program with a regular audit. And we have to look at, the, at all the, default, the disposable faults and what we can change uh, in, in, in the reprocessing uh, flow and use of specific brushes of each endoscope type. And no reuse of single use brushes for one. And so we have to use one brush for one endoscope only. Can we optimize the reprocessing cycle? A double reprocessing with a high level disinfection. We see a, a small reduction, but it is not zero. Uh, and we, we are looking at the ethylene oxide gas sterilization, but again, uh, it's, it's a grease time is needed. So is that the solution? Probably not. Again, the human factor is really important in this reprocessing cycle. And then again, in 2019, the FDA came with a recommendation. Um, so uh, the, they recommend to transition to the udinoscope disposable components to reduce the risk of patient infection. And that's a, a, a good step forward. So move away from the fixed end caps to disposable or to fully disposable duodenoscope. And also the ESDE and SGNA came later with uh, the same recommendation. So uh, uh, look at all the disposable uh, um, accessories and begin to de developing a transition plan to replace the conventional duodenal cap with the fax cap to the disposable uh, end cap and encourage the manufacturers in it. And also the ATP tests should not be used to assess duodenal scopes, also step. So if we look now the last two years, have we've seen that the manufacturers changing now in their development developments of the endoscope. We see they move away from the fixed cap to the disposable cap. And there are different caps at the moment now from Pentax is an elevator inside or the Olympus uh, version. So everybody is uh, uh, realizing now that it is an important thing in endoscopy. So the take home message will be at least following the guidelines, always stay up with the to date with the latest guidelines and start the conversation with your stakeholders. Find ways to implement guidelines correctly and ongoing. And the human factors plays a significant role in implement training and regular audits. Reduce the risk of human errors and by using disposables. Thank you very much. Marion. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. I was wondering, um, now every country, especially in Europe, they have their own guidelines, I think, and approximately we have about 27 guidelines now, I think, all focusing specifically on different standards and levels of hygiene. Don't you think it would be better to just have one specific standardized European or EMEA regulation? And I was wondering, what's your view on that? And maybe does the SGNA have a specific view on this? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, it's, that's really the difficult one, I think, uh, because um, uh, when, when I look at all the guidelines uh, used in, uh, in Europe, um, the SGNA guideline is, is leading and that's what I see, but in every country you have your own opinion about your own regulation, and that makes it really difficult uh, to deal with that. So it will be a really advantage that's, uh, uh, if we have really one guidelines, and, uh, but, but the guideline is not a law, and, and, and that makes it really difficult, I think. Uh, so... We, uh, for SGNA, it's really important uh, to, to promote our guideline and to see and uh, to realize people that uh, the human factor and uh, the, uh, following the guideline is important. And um, at the moment, that's, that's uh, uh, our motivation to go on and go on. But make it a standard, make it a law or something like that, 
uh, at the moment it's not possible, but maybe in the future, uh, okay. because we definitely need uh, a regulation. That's okay. right. Okay, well, thanks for that. I'm sure we'll also uh, touch on that when we have the, the joint panel discussion here. Um, I'd like to now go to our next speaker. So thanks, Marion. And um, our next speaker is Professor Bruno. And Professor Bruno is going to speak about the burden of an outbreak due to contaminated endoscopes. And he's with us here in the studio. So um, I'd like to say, Bruno, it's all yours. Take it away. Thank you very much, and thanks for being part of this interesting symposium. And indeed, I'm going to talk to you about the burden of an outbreak due to contaminated endoscopes, and that's mainly because I was part of one of these outbreaks, and I have some inside knowledge. These are my disclosures, just to start with my presentation, things that I do for companies and uh, um, involvement in societies and, and governmental institutions. And to start off with, um, the question is, of course, as we do endoscopy already for many, many, many decades, is this whole thing with regard to endoscope contamination and patient infections a new issue? And it's not. It's as old as endoscopy has been around. And if you look in the literature, you will find very old reports already of contaminations of endoscopes. I think um, in the last few years, we have been kind of ignorant to the problem. Uh, the complications of contamination and reusable endoscopes. Until a few years ago, when some of us got, got kind of infected with these scopes, we had contaminations, and patients become infected with uh, some bacteria. The reason also why we now have more attention is that the number of endoscopies over the world have increased with such a huge number. Also, we're doing endoscopies in sicker patients, elderly patients, patients that are immunocompromised, and simply the risk of contamination and an attracting an infection is higher. If we look in the literature and we look at reports of incidence of infections after ESP, it's somewhere between 2 and 4 percent. In my view, this is grossly underestimated, and to get a grip on these numbers, it's important to uh, be knowledgeable about a few concepts. First of all, if we have an infection after endoscopy, we can talk about endogenous infection, and that's an infection that we cannot prevent because it's simply the transport of bacteria that are already inside the gut tumor of the patient into the bloodstream. This is an inherent complication factor of endoscopy. But we also have exogenous infections, and that's when we truly bring in a bacteria from a patient that was scoped before into the next patient, and that's something that is preventable. And in fact, we should prevent that from happening in patients. It's always very important to have the knowledge about the concept of what we call multi-drug resistant organisms. So organisms that are resistant to certain bacteria, um, and they become kind of apparent because they tend to occur in clusters, and that's the reason why we as physicians, but also our microbiologists, are kind of attracted towards a possible outbreak but you also have pan-sensitive microorganisms, and that's an organism that responds very quickly to antibiotics. So even if you have a patient where you bring a bacteria from a previous patient to the next patient, that patient will get fever, but you just give antibiotics, the patient recovers within 24 hours, and you probably won't even assume that it might have been a device uh, cross-contaminated type of infection. These contaminations of scopes in the beginning have been kind of brought into kind of view with regard to breaches in reprocessing, but it's very important to realize that um, there have also been outbreaks very well documented where there were no breaches in the reprocessing process. As already was alluded to, all these outbreaks have been linked to, in particular, complex endoscopes, scopes with a complex design that are relatively difficult to clean. We in Rotterdam, uh, where I'm heading the department, were confronted with an outbreak um, we dated back to April 2012, where all of a sudden there were 30 patients with a VIM2 positive Pseudomonas aeruginosa identified, uh, and it was kind of apparent that 22 of them had undergone an ERCP at that time with a specific endoscope that we used, the TGF Q180V. Um, those 30 were an enormous significant increase as compared to the normal kind of numbers of outbreak in hospital, about two to three per month. And then, of course, we uh, started all kinds of investigations, epidemiological, genetic and technical investigations to find out what was the culprit and the cause of this infectious outbreak. This is an important slide to show you because we dismantled the scopes that we thought were involved 
And although these scopes are only a few months old and have not been used in that many patients, you can already see that there is quite some wear and tear on these scopes. For example, at the area of the lens, you can already see some corrosion having occurred behind the, uh, the, um, the lens and the, 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 the glass plate. You can also see that there are some cracks and breaches in the plastics surrounding these areas. Also importantly, as you can see here in the O-ring, which is supposed to, to, to kind of seal off the outside world from the inside world, you see cracks. And if you look very closely under the electron microscope, you can see that the surface is incredibly rough. And indeed, we found fluid behind the O-ring. We did uh, these epidemiological investigations, and in particular, and that's important, molecular typing uh, of these duodenoscopes, and we could show that the infection that we found in the scope was exactly linked to the infections we found in the patient. So that was a causal relationship. We found, in particular, materials under the um, uh, forceps elevator, and that was that uh, Pseudomonas aragonosa that we then isolated. Uh, there was some kind of uh, biological materials where this kind of clotted and adhered behind the forceps elevator. The outbreak that we had in our uh, institution immediately ended when we took uh, both of these scopes out of uh, surface, and that was in March 2012. Um, and I showed you what we did in the technical university. We completely dismantled the scope, and in particular, the technical people found the, uh, the, the things that they found with the O-ring, the leakage, very concerning and an important uh, area of, of, of uh, potential improvement of scopes. Now, should this all be a concern? Well, I think obviously, because worldwide, worldwide, multiple patients have become very seriously ill, and also some have died. If you now look in the literature, there are more than 40 infectious outbreaks reported, um, 35 deaths have been reported, and I'm sure as was already alluded to, uh, this is only the tip of the iceberg because I believe that many uh, colleagues around the world do not recognize uh, uh, infections in patients as related to endoscopes, in particular when sensitive bacteria are involved. And even if colleagues have uh, uh, had experience with infectious outbreaks, they didn't publish it in the literature. Uh, so we don't know about it because there's no uh, uh, registration of infectious outbreaks. So there's reporting bias in the literature. It's also important because not only there's patient burden, but endoscope-associated infections prolong hospital admission and, of course, are uh, related to cost because in hospital admission and giving patients antibiotics and even ICU admittance, uh, a lot of costs are involved. In the Netherlands, we did a cross-sectional examination uh, study where we um, cultured all uh, complex uh, scopes, so duodenal scopes, ERCP scopes, EUS scopes, and of all the scopes hanging in the dry cabinet ready for use in patients, 13%, 13% was positive for an oral or GI bacteria, independent of scope type or brand. And the fact that we found this oral or GI bacteria, that means that must have been a bacteria from a previous patient. So this is surely something that you want to avoid. Another important concern, I think, in this whole uh, topic, which is not often addressed, is the fact that um, endoscope-associated infections are treated with broad-spectrum antibiotics, and they can cause multidrug resistance. So sometimes we have a multidrug resistant organism being involved in an outbreak, but if we don't, we give antibiotics, and because we give them, we might induce multidrug resistance. And that's incredibly important, and the World Health Organization recognizes this, and as you can see, they have some statements antimicrobial resistance threatens the effective prevention and treatment of an ever-increasing range of infections caused by bacteria, parasites, viruses and fungi. And a second statement, antimicrobial resistance is an increasingly serious threat to the global public health that requires um, action across all government sectors and society. Now, what is the chance that an individual patient gets infected? That's a question that's often been asked uh, to me. And that's a difficult question to answer because it's a highly complex chance calculation with some cumulative probabilities, and it depends on many factors. First of all, the prevalence rate of bacteria, in particular MDROs, in patients undergoing endoscopy. Um, and there is a huge variation across the world in different countries with regard to the MDRO prevalence, which can range somewhere between a few percent up to 60, 70 percent. The risk probability that the endoscopy is performed with a scope that is contaminated by virulent bacteria, and I will show you a slide later on to kind of uh, illustrate this with a typical MDRO. 
Uh, Marion alluded to this very, very important training and compliance of personnel to, uh, to the uh, instructions of cleaning scopes. A systematic monitoring of contamination. Uh, I think that you should at least every month culture scopes to be aware of a potential uh, contamination. It is not a for sure type of uh, system that you introduce, but at least you get some feel of whether scopes are contaminated. Very important patient factors. The sicker the patient, the more uh, immunology comp compromised the patient is, the, li the more likely the patient will be uh, infected. And of course, the type and the duration of the procedure. The more you breach mucosal barriers, the longer you are um, endoscoping, and the higher the likelihood of bacterial translocation. Um, now, in view of this, we did a recent um, uh, investigation uh, with regard to an outbreak uh, in the Utrecht uh, Academic uh, Center where there was a multidrug resistant outbreak with the Klebsiella pneumoniae related to two uh, scopes. There were 102 patients that are undergoing ERCP scope with these two affected scopes. Um, uh, they were all invited for screening and we did cultures of 81 patients who were available and we had 27 patients with this multi-resistant Klebsiella pneumoniae. And then you can do a um, kind of a simple um, um, calculation with 10 patients really having an active infection so the remaining patients, 17, were carriers of the MDRO and might then cross-contaminate devices or next patients, for example. But these two endoscopes had attack rates, so that means if the scope is contaminated, the chance that if you then get a uh, scope with that scope, that you will get an infection, is 35% and 29%. So roughly one out of three patients that were scoped with the contaminated scope got an infection or at least got contaminated, which I think is a very serious concern. So to get to the end of my, um, my, um, my talk, I think that infections transmitted by complex endoscope are very real and we should be concerned about this. Um, their incidence is underestimated and what we know is probably the tip of the iceberg. They cause substantial burden uh, for patients, obviously, but also for the healthcare system in terms of labour, time investment and costs. The recognition of these um, uh, infections or these contaminations requires uh, awareness. You have to be uh, uh, knowledgeable about the potential of contamination and how this works. You have to be vigilant with regard to trying to, um, to, uh, to show that there's a possible contamination. And lastly, also very important, prevention of scope-related infections requires dedicated teamwork, constant monitoring, Close, contact, close contact with your microbiologist and importantly, the end, and the people in the endoscope department should regularly have contact with the people cleaning their scopes because they are the ones that make sure that the scope that you use in the endoscopy room is safe for your patient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bruno. Um, that, those are quite some significant serious numbers that you mentioned here, one out of three if the scope is contaminated that a patient might have some very serious implications. Um, did, is it at all possible to kind of talk a little bit about the true costs, maybe even from a monetary point of view also, of the outbreak that you had in your hospital? And, and what would be your, really, your specific recommendation to uh, prevent something like this? It's, it's incredibly difficult to put a true yeah. number, of course, but I can tell you um, if this happens, uh, the investigations you have to put up you know, trying to trace back infections and pot potential contamination patients, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of work, labour work. The cultures cost a lot of money. Uh, you, you saw we, we took out of a surface these two scopes, we completely dismantled them, so we, we took the responsibility to start up a whole investigation trying to get to the bottom of the reason of the contamination infections. Um, that costs a lot of money. Um, 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 it's, it's not possible for me to put a number on this, but is this very much something you want to avoid? Um, and with regard to trying to prevent this, um, what is incredibly important is, in, in my view, we will, with the reusable devices, we will not reach a zero level of contamination. It's, it's, it's just impossible. We don't have much time to go into this, but the, le the level of the margin of safety we have with the current uh, processing, reprocessing techniques is just not good enough. So there's always a chance of contamination, but in particular the, the, the strict adherence to these instructions of the manufacturer, which is not easy because Mayon already um, told rightfully there are 130 steps involved to clean the scope, and every scope has a different instruction set. So imagine for these people in the, in the, uh, in the hygiene uh, rooms to clean the scopes, you know, a, a mistake is easily made. 
So we have, them, we have to give them the proper position within the endoscopy team that they are recognized for their work and that they also understand that what they do is important for the safety of the patient. And strict adherence, and in particular, what many people forget, the manual pre-cleaning, the manual pre-cleaning step is the most important step of the scope cleaning process. If the manual pre-cleaning is not done sufficiently enough, the whole high-level disinfection will fail. I think those are the most important topics for. Okay. Cleaning. Well, thanks for that. I'm also sure we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we get into the um, panel discussion. Um, just for the audience, um, you can now really submit your questions and your comments so that we can already start um, looking at them and make sure that we can address them all in a later stage. Um, so now we're going to go uh, to Professor Lepeltier, um, who is online, uh, and he is going to talk about the importance of drying, the reduction of biofilm formation with the use of plasma typhoon and plasma bag. Professor Lepeltier, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction um, and good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to thank the organizers of this uh, event uh, to give me the, the opportunity to highlight the importance of drying to reduce uh, of biofilm formation with the use of a device that we call plasma typhon and also to store a flexible endoscope by uh, the device that we call plasma bag. In this first slide, you, you can see my uh, hospital in, in Nantes, in France. That, that is a, a very large university hospital with uh, 3,000 beds. And we are performing each year more than uh, 20,000 uh, endoscopies. So what is the biofilm? Bacteria readily adhere to wet surfaces and form organized colonies of cells enclosed in a self excreted matrix composed principally of polysaccharide uh, that facilitates adhesion to an inert of a uh, living surface. This type of bacterial organization is termed biofilm and was originally uh, noted in 1936. The microorganisms that form biofilms include bacteria, fungi, and protists. Perhaps the most of common biofilm familiar to all of us is the dental plaque, as you know. That sticky, colorless film of bacteria and sugars that constantly forms our teeth, that, that we call slime on the surface of water, particularly ponds, is also biofilm. Um, the sl slimy film starts forming when initially free floating bacteria adhere to surfaces in aqueous environment and start laying their roots. As you can see in this figure on the right of the slide, uh, first of all, you can observe a single free floating bacteria land on surface. Then in a second step, bacterial cells aggregate on and attach to this surface. Then in a third step, growth and division of bacteria for, for biofilm formation. And then you can see a mature biofilm formation. And in the last step that can uh, um, um, provide uh, um, infection uh, for in or out patients with uh, endoscopy, a part of biofilm disperses to release free floating bacteria for further colonization. Then, uh, to stick, stick the bacteria is creates a glue-like substance that effective at anchoring them to all kinds of material from plastic to soil to medical implant and of course, such as uh, a flexible endoscope. This glue is known as an extracellular polymeric substance and is compressed of sugars, protein, and nucleic acid like DNA. This means that bacteria are sometimes joined together, cling to essentially uh, uh, any surface and form a protective matrix around the group. However, it's only in wet and most environments that you're uh, the most uh, biofilm. 
What the, the consequences? What 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 are the outcome uh, with a biofilm? However, um, despite their early discovery, it has only been relatively recently that their major impact on infection control uh, had been uh, realized, even if infection are very uh, low. We only uh, speak about uh, endoscope contamination with biofilm. Biofilm can form on or in many medical devices, uh, with, as we see, uh, such as contact lenses, central venous catheters, urinary catheters, and endoscopes. It frequently results in nosocomial infection with implant loss in uh, hospital and can be associated uh, with an increase in patient morbidity and healthcare costs. So what about retroprocessing and, and cleaning? Current recommendations for endoscope retroprocessing include a cleaning step involving immersion of the endoscope in a detergent with brushing, a larger channel and flushing of all channel, followed by high-level disinfection or chemical sterilization. We know that uh, flexible endoscope are complex devices, uh, difficult to clean, but it's very, very important to, to clean, to dry, to, to store endoscope because they are reused in uh, patients. And has the high turnover uh, of, the, of the clinical uh, units that use flexible endoscope, we must be careful with uh, human uh, mistakes in the retroprocessing and cleaning uh, um, performance. So detergent containing enzymes uh, such as protease and amylase are subject for increased efficacy, efficacy in removing soil. So you can see uh, in this slide uh, our uh, non-university um, hospital retroprocessing center for flexible endoscopes. Uh, this center is equipped with a six soluscope cabinet that we, you can see uh, here. Uh, seven soluscope uh, that are retroprocessor, you can see here, and a special one for ENT uh, activity. We are also uh, have uh, three plasma uh, typhons, uh, and we um, our perk is um, um, including more than uh, 200 flexible endoscopes from nine different services, such as uh, gastroenterology, uh, pneumology, ICU, uh, urology departments, pediatrics departments, uh, ENT departments, etc. We have also two robotic transport. I will show you two slides with those robotics transport to transport uh, flexible endoscope between our center and the, and the medical uh, uh, units. And seven professionals, uh, auxiliary nurse are working uh, in this center from uh, seven to the morning to eight in the, in the evening. We are performing more than uh, uh, 20,000 cleaning disinfection cycles per year. Uh, um, each day, uh, more than 100 endoscopes are disinfected, and we are performing more than 200 micro microbiologic samples per year to assess the um, uh, microbiologic um, uh, contamination of uh, our uh, endoscopes uh, park. So what are the, the key factors? Uh, uh, to uh, for our uh, retroprocessing centers from the, the, the use of endoscopes in uh, clinical uh, units, uh, the bedside pre-cleaning right after the exam, then the transport, and you can see here in, in these two photo photographs the, 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 two, uh, the two robots that we, we, we call uh, Scopy and, and, and Maya. Uh, they, they perform uh, more than uh, uh, 1,000 journeys per month. Uh, approximately 100 kilometers for the transports. Um, then the manual cleaning and brushing, then the automated cleaning and disinfection in a, a retroprocessor, and then uh, a transport uh, to, uh, to store uh, endoscope. So you, you can guess that we are only able to store uh, 48 endoscope in our six cabinets because we have only uh, eight uh, places for uh, each cabinet then you, you, we, we need to store uh, um, endoscope with the, the, the plasma bag. So endoscope drying and, and storage. Um, 
at the end of the washing and disinfecting procedure, the possibility of to use a, a system that dry completely the channel uh, uh, of the untreatment and protect it from the development of biofilm. So we can see in, in this uh, photo the, 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 the device, so the plasma uh, typhoon, that is an automatic device to quickly dry the endoscope channels after disinfection uh, as an automatic washer disinfectant machine. Uh, with a drying cycle uh, uh, up to one, two minutes uh, uh, um, uh, with the medical air. Very easy to use. Uh, instead, the, 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 the last uh, um, uh, systems with the uh, medical air, uh, with a very lot of noise and a, a, long, a, a long drying uh, period. Uh, so we, we, we like to use a plasma typhoon because it's a shorter time and, and, and an easy use of, of the, the, the machine uh, with a high level of, uh, of drying. And also this machine can, uh, that we call plasma bag can be used to store endoscope uh, uh, with a guarantee to keep the instruments disinfected uh, in a seven day period for the French guidelines. But I, I know we can uh, improve this period to, to one month. Uh, in other countries. Uh, we use a barcode traceability system uh, to identify operator and endoscope. And we badge instruments uh, um, to reduce the risk of uh, uh, instrument contamination during the storage and, and transport. So you can see here a, a little film. I don't know if I have time to show you one or two minutes. And I would like to thank Professor Paolo Archidiacomono from Milano. In this little movie, you can see how to use the, the plasma typhoon. You can see here with a, with a connection, OK? Then this slide to show you uh, that we, we perform more than uh, 200 uh, samples uh, to assess the contamination of our uh, park of flexible endoscopy. As you can see in this uh, graph, we improve the, uh, the, the conform uh, sample from 40% in uh, 2011 when we open our center to uh, uh, more uh, than 76% uh, uh, of conformity. And in the same time, we decrease the unconformed uh, sample. Uh, you, you can see that 24% uh, uh, of our samples are not conform, but that concern only uh, 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 loaner or return endoscopes that needs to be disinfected again before be used again in clinical units. That means that uh, main of our endoscope in uh, uh, routinely use in different clinical units are uh, always or most always uh, uh, um, conform. So to conclude my, my presentation, uh, we adopt this uh, solution to an FHC uh, plasma typhoon solution. Uh, plasma Typhoon is a, a ultra fast drying unit for endoscope, uh, very easy to, 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 to use. Plasma bag is a single use device for active storage with plasma that uh, completes our uh, system, but we are only able to store uh, in retroprocessors uh, 48 endoscope. And we have different uh, clinical units that are very far from our uh, uh, retroprocessing center. Maybe by foot, you, you need 20 minutes to go to a, a, a medical unit. So it's why we, we use uh, robotics uh, to, to improve this uh, time of uh, transport. Uh, so we need to complete our storage uh, by plasma bag. And as you see in this slide, uh, we use uh, um, uh, storage with uh, plasma bag for 12 pulmonary endoscopes, uh, uh, 30 endoscopes in gastroenterology departments, 30 endoscopes in pulmonary uh, departments, and uh, 15 uh, endoscopes in the pediatric uh, department. And we are currently trying to use a plasma bag uh, to store uh, urologic endoscope. 
So uh, using those kind of uh, device uh, can uh, minimize the risk of bacterial contamination through a highly effective drying mechanism for the endoscopic channels that are very difficult to, to, to treat and to reduce of endoscope retroprocessing cycle uh, times. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Le Pelletier. That's very interesting. I was wondering, you've been focusing very much on the drying part in your last uh, part of the presentation. From your point of view, do you think this is still uh, the drying? Is that an underestimated step in the reprocessing currently around the globe? Oh, oh I think everyone in um, retroprocessor center no, that's this uh, step is a very uh, uh, important uh, step to uh, reduce the formation of biofilm. But I, I, I don't know uh, in France or in uh, other countries through the world if everyone used uh, efficiently a uh, uh, device. So uh, usually, as we, we did before, we use uh, the, the uh, medical air with a long time to, to, uh, to dry on the scope with a lot of noise. And I, I, I don't know if this uh, uh, old way to, to, to dry is, is so, um, is so uh, useful now when we can use this kind of uh, device such as uh, plasma typhoon. Okay, that's maybe, maybe we, we it will be interesting to to assess how, how many uh, uh, centers use a uh, different way uh, to to dry endoscope. But I, I think everyone knows that is a very uh, important step in the in, in the retroprocessing um, uh, endoscopes. Okay, well, thank you for that, and I'm sure we'll discuss that in a little bit as well. Um, we're a little bit behind, a couple of minutes, but I think we're going to be fine. And the next speaker is Paul Cesar from Pentax Medical. And Paul will be focusing on the importance of training as a core competency. He's with us in the studio. So, Paul, I would say it's all yours. Take it away. Okay. Thank you very much um, for the introduction. Um, yeah. My title is The Importance of Training as a Core Competency. Um, well, i like to start with this one. It's a quote from Florence Nightingale, and when we are talking about healthcare and uh, even in uh, endoscopy and endoscopy reprocessing, for the sick it is important to have the best. Uh, I think it's nothing to discuss on that. And it's also the one from, uh, which is a very famous one, first do no harm. And that is what also is uh, one of the, the first uh, sentences in our Dutch guideline on endoscope reprocessing in our quality uh, book of the uh, reprocessing of flexible endoscopes. So uh, endoscopes, are they risky devices? Looking at the previous pre presentations, yes, there were human factors, failures. There were uh, talks about biofilms or contaminated endoscopes. And even we discussed outbreaks. Uh, but we almost forget that endoscopy and endoscopes have a lot of benefits. And, of course, it was already addressed. Uh, but it's very important to have a proper care and handling of these devices uh, to minimize uh, repair costs, uh, but also to uh, foster patients' safety. But, unfortunately, post post-colonoscopy, endoscopy infection rates are higher than th thought. And uh, it was assumed that it was one in a million, uh, but the last years uh, it was discussed and it was uh, also published that it is one in a thousand. So uh, when we are looking at uh, flexible endoscopes and outbreaks, uh, it's almost about inf ineffective cleaning and disinfection. Contamin uh, it's about 50%. And these are data from Yulia Kovaleva. Uh, contamination and failure of automated endoscope reprocessors, about 20%. And yes, in the previous uh, presentation, we talked about drying of endoscopes, the ineffective dry procedure and storage, about 20%. And of course, the design, the failures in flexible endoscopes uh, contribute to uh, only 8%. And biofilm in flexible endoscopes, but even biofilms in Automated endoscope reprocessors are 4%. So looking at the first uh, three one, ineffective cleaning, contamination, ineffective dry procedures, it's almost about 90% contribute to outbreaks. Um, and it was always challenging. Endoscope reprocessing was always challenging. Um, it was in the 60s 
of the, the previous uh, era, also a, prob a problem in which was published. Uh, and even today, uh, it's said, even after reprocessing, many scopes stay dirty. But let us have a look at the reprocessing. It's quite complex. Marion de Pater also uh, mentioned that there were more than 130 steps to reprocess just one flexible endoscope. And when we look at the stages in reprocessing, uh, it starts with the bedside cleaning, a leak test, a manual cleaning, the rinsing, a high level disinfection, again the rinsing and the drying and the storage. And it's more than just a flush and a brush, and then the people, the staff has also to do a functional and visual inspection. So it's quite a daily challenge. The bedside cleaning, manual cleaning, the high level disinfection, the rinsing and the drying and storage to prevent that the next patient will be contaminated with the flora of the previous patient. And yeah, it looks like an Olympic game every day. It's a quite uh, a daily challenge. And when we look at this slide, uh, the time needed for just the manual cleaning, it's about 25 minutes. It was also stated by Corey Ofsted in 2017 and also by Marion de Pater. And uh, yes, I took her data and it, the time spent on the reprocessing, the manual cleaning uh, is only 6.5 minutes. So it's not rare that these endoscopes are not really clean after reprocessing. And as Gina also stated, there is a lack of access to and of understanding manufacturers validated instructions for reprocessing, a lack of knowledge or unfamiliarity with endoscope channels, accessories and reprocessing devices, and inadequate training. It was already mentioned. And for us, it's a challenge to change. And uh, this is a, a nice one from a German professor, Dr. Otmar Leis, uh, who says, endoscopy reprocessing is just a high-risk technology and, uh, and uh, needs a, a safety culture. And I think that's the most important what we are discussing here today. And it's a challenge for us to change. Cleaned endoscopes often still contaminated. Uh, because it are complicated steps, it was already mentioned. Um, but uh, it's also said that uh, uh, it are very complicated pieces of equipment. And when hospitals do everything right, we still have a risk associated with these devices, uh, Janet ha Haas said. Um, and then she says, no one, none of us have the answer right now. But don't we have the answer, I think? The answer is education and training. When, why and how do we reprocess flexible endoscopes? It starts with the bedside cleaning, followed by the manual uh, cleaning, the high level disinfection, the rinsing and the drying and storage to prevent transmission of microorganisms from one patient to another patient. And I think we need to investigate in the people, the processes and the products. And we believe also that an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. It was stated by Benjamin Franklin. And that's why we started our hygiene program. Our hygiene training program is divided. It comes from hygiene, which is, of course, from hygiene. High is bringing it to a higher level when we're talking about knowledge, skills and competence. And gene, it's the part of our DNA. It must be into our genes. And when we do that, I think, and I believe, and it was also uh, published uh, by, by uh, an Austrian uh, group, uh, that high quality endoscope reprocessing decreases endoscope contamination. So we believe that training people uh, will help in uh, minimize the risk of infection. And our starting point is reprocessing must be performed in a professional and adequate way to ensure a safe use on subsequent patients. We have to understand the endoscopy, anatomy and technology. The people have to know the consequences of nosocomial infections caused by endoscopes not reprocessed adequately, the effects on patients, but also on the costs. Uh, they need to know the professional care and handling of endoscopes and equipment to keep the endoscopes in the proper and ideal working order. And that prolongs the life of the endoscope, the equipment and the accessories. Minimize the expenses of repairs, which is also important, and of course the cost reduction. And our training program will be in two stages. The first stage is 
to train our intern Pentax staff, and the second stage is to go outside uh, our institute and to train other people in hospitals. So just a highlight in our hygiene program, it starts with the theory uh, stage, basic history of endoscopy, anatomy of the endoscope, principles of infections. Of course, what are the risks of contaminated flexible endoscopes? How do we reprocess the endoscopes? And it's also about quality management. And then there is, uh, 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 it's important to do it yourself, the reprocessing steps. The people have to do a proof of competency. And that means that he has to do all the steps in the reprocessing under supervision. Uh, using a standardized scenario, of course, practice, do the practice with the Q&A, which and why, which steps are taken, why, which materials are needed, and then they become a certificate from Pentax Medical. But it's not the initial training, it's also to do it yearly. We have to re-educate the people and retrain the people every year. Of course, with an e-learning, it's, it's, uh, it can be important. Of course, also with the Q&A and also becoming a certificate by Pentax Medical. And I think hygiene is our statement to optimize, to minimize, to minimize the risk of infection. And um, that is very important. Why? Because it's in our hygiene commitment and we take care of the patients. We are offering solutions that minimize the risk of infections. And um, when we do that, the human failure, biofilms, contaminated endoscopes and outbreaks, we think we will have the right solution to eliminate this. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, um, Paul. That was very interesting. Um, listen, so I think, um, and we also spoke about this last year in uh, Augsburg with different um, experts. I mean, for many decades, this education and training in the reprocessing of flexible endoscopes has been, of course, high on the agenda in many guidelines, etc. cetera. Um, from your point of view, do you think training is still an issue? And if so, why is that? Yeah, I still think training is an issue. And... Um yeah, there are many reasons for it, and uh, Marion de Pater also mentioned someone, um, and, and also Professor Bruno mentioned someone. It's uh, the people are doing the job, the reprocessing. They are often, um, yeah, not seen as very professional people in the hospital, and we think they are key professionals, and we want them to become key professionals in reprocessing flexible endoscopes, and that's need training. That's need education. Okay. You have to learn them uh, how to reprocess these complex devices. It's not just one or two hours training. No, it's, I, we believe that it must be a compact, strong training program. Yeah, it must be in the DNA of everybody within it the It must unit. be in the DNA, just what I said in my presentation. Yeah, it must be in their genes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, why don't you join us uh, back over here because um, for the next, let's say, 35 minutes, um, we're going to have an open discussion also with the people online. Um, we already have some questions coming in. So, for instance, James Glavin from the UK already asked a question, which we will definitely treat at the later part of the discussion. Um, let's see. Uh, Marion mentioned in her presentation, um, are we only seeing the tip in the iceberg, um, the tip of the iceberg in terms of infection rates uh, in endoscopy? And maybe we can just talk with everybody here and maybe starting with you, uh, Professor Bruno. Do you agree that it's only the tip of the iceberg that we're seeing currently? Absolutely. I'm very sure about this. I kind of alluded to this issue in my presentation. Um, if you would have asked me the same question like 10 years ago, I would probably kind of look ignorant and say, well, I don't think there's a big issue in endoscopy. Um, and again, only when you get confronted with this and you see the enormous burden for patients, but also for your whole system comes from this outbreak, you do realize this is a very critical process. Um, so absolutely, and I, I also fully agree to the fact that the ignorance that we had, uh, also from my part, from the part of the people running endoscopy business, we have to give the people that clean these scopes a very prominent role. And we have to take them seriously. We have to give them the time to do a proper job. 
And that's not what they have been doing so far. I think they deserve a better place with regard to cleaning scopes. Okay, thanks for that. Professor Le Pelletier, is that something that you um, agree with? Is that also something you see in your institution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, about the, the, the training, Be before we, we create our uh, retroprocessing center, uh, we, we, we um, had uh, almost eight different little retroprocessing center in each medical unit, you know, and each day in my hospital, more than 2,000 healthcare workers were able to, to, to disinfect manually an endoscope. Then in uh, 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 2012, create this uh, center and only professional, only uh, my team, about uh, uh, seven nurses treat every day as professional uh, endoscopes. So we, we show a uh, decrease of unconfirmed microbiologic samples uh, uh, from 40% uh, 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 of unconfirmed uh, uh, um, samples to uh, 80 confirm uh, 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 microbiologic samples. So I, I don't know what is exactly the role of the, the drying of the, the disinfection, mechanic uh, uh, disinfection, but I think to, to, to perform one center with a high level uh, process uh, 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 increase the, the, the security of our uh, endoscope without be able to, to measure the biofilm in uh, channels, you know, but it's all the process that uh, 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 a good a good way to to reduce uh, infection. Okay, and uh, Marion, um, how about within your institution? Uh, we heard Bruno also say that sometimes it's not yet really recognized the value of the staff that's looking into this. Is that something you come across as well? Uh, no, I totally agree. Also with uh, Marco. And um, what we have seen in the last 10 years, that uh, we've seen um, a completely uh, we go away from the di uh, diagnostic endoscopes, uh, endoscopies, and we perform now more and more um, uh, almost surgical uh, endoscopies. And uh, it, that's not similarly, similarly uh, what we've done with the disinfection of the endoscope. So we are, uh, yeah, we are now upgrading uh, everything. So, and I totally agree with you. Is that we definitely need a dedicated team for uh, for cleaning of the endoscopes and for drying process and transport, because we cannot um, uh, uh, accept anymore that that nurses are performing uh, the endoscope, uh, assisting the doctors, and then responsible for the endoscopes. Um, we realize now. That's this a really important job uh, to clean the endoscopes, and that you definitely need time for it. Um, so I've, I've seen the changes, uh, yeah, the, the last 10 years, and I'm really uh, glad that we have a dedicated team now in our hospital. And I, I have, for instance, I make an, uh, an appointment with the people over there that they are only uh, are responsible for for the for the cleaning and uh, manual cleaning for two hours and that not more than a change uh, to another uh, to the to, to the clean area or have uh, from the dirty to the cleaning area because uh, you make uh, uh, you you go around uh, around uh, uh, for instance during an hour uh, 30 endoscopes and then it's easily the, uh, to miss a step in that so Two hours is the maximum, I think, for manual cleaning and then move away from it and do something else, else in the uh, disinfection area. Yeah. So, yeah, we make some steps. Okay. And um, maybe to you, Paul, I mean, we heard Professor Le Pelletier um, talk about how he tackles this. Is that also your experience from Pentax medical point of view, the, the institutions you come across by? Are we improving the way we are disinfecting and trying to reduce those, uh, redu those infection rates? <clears throat> Yeah, I think we do. We, are do. we do improve the reprocessing, but it's just a small step. And I think we are talking about many decades for reprocess on the reprocessing endoscopes, but it are so little tiny steps. And I think we have to make a huge step. And I think, um, yeah, we can do it. But how do we make that huge step then? What is necessary for that? What is necessary is... Yeah. is uh, to give the experts uh, uh, 
uh, doing their job and, and uh, talking about the risk of, of uh, endoscope reprocessing when it's not good uh, performed, for example. And I think I agree fully with the previous speakers. You have to be create. You must create a dedicated team. It's not only the nurse, it's not only the doctor, but it's also the reprocessing staff. And they should know what they are doing. The nurse should know what the reprocessing staff is do doing. But the doctor also needs to know that it's not just a five-minute uh, flush and a brush of an, a very complex deodenoscope. So, yeah, I think that should also be part of the training program that the doctor jumps in the reprocessing room and, yeah performs a reprocessing of the endoscope. Yeah, and I see you wanted to say something, yeah, Professor know, Bruno. It starts with recognition. Yeah. You know, one of the problems we have right now, the people that watch this session, they are kind of already aware of the problem. And yeah. of course, you know, it's good that we discuss and that we exchange knowledge, but the majority of the people are not watching this eh, because there are, across the world, hundreds of thousands of people involved with endoscopy work. Yeah. It's, it starts with recognition of the issue, and I believe that still too many people do not believe that this is a significant problem. And you know, the, the way I always try to get a feel for whether the person that I talk with or discuss with has some kind of feel for the problem, I ask them whether they know the names of their reprocessing personnel. Yeah. If they don't know the first name of their reprocessing people, they have never been to a reprocessing unit, and they don't care about scope cleaning. And you know the first names of yes. your... Okay. How about you, Professor Le Pelletier? Do you know the first name of your reprocessing staff over there in Nantes? The, the first... Pardon? The first name? Yeah, the first names of all the staff that help you with the cleaning and the, of the reprocessing of the endoscopes. Do you know who they are? The, the, um... Probably uh, in, in um, um, doctors in the gastro uh, uh, gastroenterology uh, uh, department. Okay, and how about you, Marion? Are you uh, very aware of who's helping you out in the in the cleaning part of the whole process? Yeah, yeah definitely. But I, I agree with Marco because I'm not aware of or the, of the doctors every, uh, knows the names of 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 the, this uh, this staff. So um, uh, it's a good point, uh, Marco. And I also believe, you know, I think Paul made a good point with regard to physicians. You know, they need to be aware of what a scope cleaning means. So I think also the residents that are being trained to become endoscopists, they should spend some time yeah. in the reprocessing unit to get a look and feel of how this works and what is involved. And they get also appreciation for the people doing that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I trained a lot of reprocessing staff and they had always to be in the endoscopy department uh, watching an endoscope uh, process examination uh, for uh, one day, mm -hmm. for example, to know I'm cleaning an endoscope and it's used for that and that examination. So, yeah, I think it's really important to know from each other what we are doing and why we are doing it and for who we are doing it. Right. Okay, that's a fair point. Um, Marion, you uh, addressed it a little bit already in your uh, presentation, and it has everything to do with guidelines and that we have so many of them, and we didn't really get a chance to dig in a little bit deeper. So how do we get to this one European guideline, or is that not necessary? I mean, do we have to think differently here? W what would you suggest? Because, you know, also head of the SG in a part. Yeah, I already mentioned it. We have our ISGINA uh, guidelines, and I know that uh, a lot of uh, countries use our uh, guidelines uh, for their own guidelines. But um, still, I, th I think we have an important role in, in, in Europe as, uh, as a society. But again, um, uh, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to say, OK, uh, in uh, Croatia or Spain, uh, you have to follow the uh, the SG, uh, GINA, ESGE um, uh, guidelines. So that's not the power we have at the moment. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, that, uh, I already said, I, I hope that everybody um, developed her, uh, their guidelines in their own countries and uh, share it with, uh, with, the, with the staff at, the, at their unit. Um, and, and that's the only thing we... Uh, promote at the moment in our uh, European group, education group, where we have contact with, with, with each 
a member of of uh, of the of the group and um yeah we do a lot of uh, educational uh, um uh, sharing in uh, in in that group for, okay yeah. Yeah, that's very clear. Um, so it's difficult, obviously. I know, Professor Bruni, you have something uh, maybe in your mind? Yes, because I think also, you know, only uh, f very lately, from the last few years, we have been taking this subject kind of seriously, and we're doing some scientific research. And when you want a, a, a guideline to be taken seriously, you have to come up with science, because that's what people believe. People believe science. So we have to treat this whole subject seriously. We have to uh, spend time, money and efforts to do good research. And that good research will guide uh, the guidance and, and the making of guidelines and make, will make them more acceptable to people because, you know, you want to follow that what is scientifically valid and true. And yep. if you are able to protect your people also from a scientific point of view, it will also be more easy for people to go, for example, to hospital directors if there is a need for investment for a certain technique of money. You need data, you need science. Yeah. Professor Le Pelletier, how do you look at this specific topic of guidelines? There are so many different guidelines in different countries with different parts of it. We just hear, heard Professor Bruno say we just need more science, more research, take it seriously, and then you know, it'll become more acceptable. How do you view this? Yes, yes, I, I agree with all the, the speakers. Uh, we, we can have in the first step uh, our, our own guidelines in our hospital uh, to be sure that all the professionals involved in uh, uh, disinfection of endoscope are aware of our protocols. Um, two years after the creation of our centers, we create um, um, a committee uh, including uh, all the, the, the doctors or surgeon of every uh, kind of um, specialties that are involved in endoscopy. And we have meeting every two months. Uh, and then uh, once a year, you, we organize uh, an event for uh, an evening to, to share new guidelines or new way to, 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 uh, to treat patient or to affect an endoscope. So this is uh, uh, um, the, the first level uh, in each uh, hospital. After, we need research. If you want to, to modify, to, to involve, or to improve uh, uh, national guidelines, we need research and results. And um, we, we need, for example, for if, if, if I want to highlight the, the, the world of drying, uh, maybe we, we, we can um, develop a study design to, to, to show uh, uh, maybe whether, whether uh, trials to, to, to compare different way of, of drying and to assess uh, the, 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 the microbiologic uh, uh, sample to, to show if, if there were a better way between different uh, methods. But effectively, uh, um, in parallel of organization uh, uh, and uh, training, we, we, we need research uh, to show the, the good way to, to, to improve disinfection. Okay, thanks for that. I mean, uh, a comment also uh, came in, which said that, you know, in many countries, there are national programs available to train a reprocessing staff. And I understand that as Gina developed a European curriculum to, stain st or to train staff in endoscope reprocessing, um, actually, the, the commenter here says that a structured training course should be mandatory which is the case in Germany, and they take five days of training. Um, so, but I think everybody's in agreement here that this obviously needs to move up the ladder. Um, also, the way we do that is kind of um, clear, I think. Anything to add from your point of view, Paul, on that? No, I think uh, the main issue is that we are dealing with uh, a reprocessing a complex device which needs uh, good eye of use which need also be trained people, uh, but also need the good eye of use. Uh, and, uh, and they need the time to do it. It was already addressed in, in previous presentations. They need the time to do the job. Yeah. That's the most important thing, I think. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and also on the guidelines, uh, yeah, I've said it before, we have one problem with contaminated endoscopes, so we should have one guideline implemented implemented in all those hospitals. And what we see now is there is a guideline and every nation has its guideline and every hospital makes its own guideline. 
Yeah, it's yeah. a little bit too much to, <laughs> all over the yeah. place. Yeah, no, I get that. And, um, but I think it's quite clear, more science, more research, take it serious, and it'll be acceptable and giving time. That's pretty much, I yes. think, what we all agree to here. Um, there are already a few questions coming in, so we will address them. Also, thank you, Melvin from the UK. There are quite a few questions for you, Professor Le Pelletier, about the plasma bag and the typhoon kit, so we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, before we get there... Um, should it be currently uh, mandatory rather than just a recommendation, and maybe if I can start with you, uh, Professor Bruno, is that we should move towards disposable components in endoscopy to really minimize this risk of infection uh, and further improve patient safety? Should this not be mandatory? It's already happening. It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, that the scope manufacturers are trying, of course, to minimize the risk, and I think rightfully so. I think they're doing their best to try to mitigate the risk. Again, I'm, 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 I'm um, very pessimistic that with reusable scopes, we will get to a zero level of, of contamination. But I'm sure that um, uh, design uh, changes to the scopes will help to minimize the risk. And you can think indeed about the tip of the endoscope. If you, I think Paul showed it or Mayon showed it. Yeah. If you look at the distal tip of an old scope and a new scope, you can see a world of a difference. And, and you know, you, you can see easily that the scope tip, the new scope tip, is much more quicker, easy to, to, to clean than the old tip. Um, the disposable valves, of course, um, is, is one of the areas. You can think even of a disposable working channel, which is not only the case in one scope. But for sure, I think um, um, it's logical to assume that it might have an influence on infection risks. But again, the data, the scientific data, is not there. Okay, so we, sure. yeah, so we assume the risk will go down, reducing it, but we don't know yet because we don't have the data. No. Okay, Mario, maybe coming to you, what is, um, you know, what's going to happen, you know, if, if we really start going to these disposable consumables, um, what, what are the implications for you and your staff in, re and, you know, in then changing the way you work? Uh, so what Marco already uh, mentioned, it makes it more easily uh, to uh, clean the endoscope. If you look at the fixed and disposable caps, yeah, uh, uh, caps it's, it's a really uh, a different uh, view, and, and it's easy uh, to clean for for the staff. Um, but uh, it's yeah, it's, it's really of the disposable files, but also the cleaning adapter. Uh, but that's not only the problem from the disposable. It, it's it's uh, again, yeah, the human factor. Uh, this the whole process uh, uh, of the endoscope, and uh, we ca we can prevent infection with uh, going on uh, to uh, to develop disposable devices for the endoscopes. But uh, to come to zero uh, infection, yeah, I, I'm not sure at the moment. I think it's an illusion, but we we are doing our best uh, with, with with training and with the um, uh, with the staff. But um, yeah. It, there is a limitation, I think, at, uh, at that point. Okay, that's uh, that's clear. Professor Le Pelletier, um, I don't know what your views are on this are, if you have any views. I understand that the U.S. Um, is currently recommending really the usage of disposable components, which is a bit of a different approach from Europe where we just recommend it. Um, do you have any specific view on this from U.S. versus Europe and why this difference is there? Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I agree that um, we, we, we need to um, uh, perform s survey of microbiology contamination. And I agree that maybe the, the, the risk zero uh, does not exist. But, but we, 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 we have to, every day, we have to be sure that professional in, in charge of the disinfection of endoscope are aware of the protocol. What, what, whatever the, 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 the hospital, the country, or, or the continent, uh, and, and, and be sure that if there is a, um, contamination, we, 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 you, are, you, you have to investigate why you observe this uh, uh, maybe uh, 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 conform uh, um, microbiologic uh, sample uh, to be sure to, to make an, an audit, an evaluation. And in a second step, if you suspect uh, uh, clinical contamination of a patient, 
uh, you also need to uh, to sample the patient, of course, to sample the endoscope, try to compare uh, bacteria if you can uh, uh, um, uh, detect bacteria uh, through the, the, the sample of the patient and in the channel of the endoscope. And uh, you, you, you need to respect this retroprocessing uh, performance and then this clinical or microbiological uh, investigation. So, um, yes, of course, we can observe differences between country. Um, for example, the, 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 um, the, 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 the time between uh, the use of an endoscope and, and the time of uh, the treatment. Uh, Marion said about two hours, but we don't know exactly if it is one hour, two hours, three hours, and maybe we can observe differences between uh, uh, countries. Uh, we can also observe differences between the duration of storage. In France, you can store in a, a cabinet or in a, in a bag an endoscope during a seven-day uh, period to be sure that you, you are the same uh, um, uh, uh, infectious statue after seven days. But I know in other country, you can reach this time to uh, uh, one month. So effectively, uh, uh, it's difficult to compare uh, different gain lengths through, through uh, countries. Okay, no, that's very clear. Uh, Paul, any views that you have on disposable components? Um, you know, should we continue with that? And maybe even going towards a complete uh, disposable one-time use endoscope? I don't know, is that something that industry is thinking about doing? I think so, we are thinking about it, yes, of course, because uh, it's very important to, to uh, minimize the risk of infection and to improve the, the patient's safety, of course, and with disposable components, we can. Uh, uh, it makes it more easier to reprocess such an endoscope. Uh, but it's also, um, yeah, it's never zero, I think, uh, but we have to minimize the risk and we can do it with products like this, these disposables, but also uh, investigate in, in the process and in the people again. It's just a triangle, people, process and products. Yeah. And when we improve one, uh, we always forget to improve on the other two. Yeah, got it. There are already quite a few questions coming in there and we're already getting around one. So let me just already start with one of the questions that is specifically for Professor uh, Bruno. Um, is frequent sampling of endoscopes essential in minimizing the risk of infection due to these contaminated endoscopes? And what alternatives are there if these guidelines do not recommend microbiological testing? I think it's a fair question, a good question. It will not ensure you complete safety. It's, it's one of the things, uh, one of the means you have to try to get grip on the whole problem of scope contamination. I'm a firm believer of doing this. We do it, for example, every month. We test all our scopes. Um, and there are, there are you know, you, you can have some negatives about this because it, it's a month. So it means that already for a month, a scope can have contaminated all those patients that have been treated with that scope in a month. That's true. But at least you have one point in time where you have the opportunity to detect a contaminated scope and to take it out of service. Um, in fact, in my hospital, we, we, we culture every scope at least the ESP scope after every procedure, but that's because we do a lot of research. Um, and when you do that, you find, uh, you do some very significant findings with regard to uh, the number of contaminations, but also the pluriformity of bacteria you find. So yes, I think in this day and age where I see what we now do as a transition period towards um, disposable scopes, I, I think when we have this discussion in 10 or 15 year time, we are discussing disposable scopes. That's my personal view. In the meantime, we have to deal with uh, reusable scopes. And, yep. You know, I think Paul made a very good statement. We should not forget endoscopy is a good thing. We save lives with endoscopy. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the good and the better, if you compare on a scale the benefits and, and the harms, of course, endoscopy is good for many, many patients. But we have to try to minimize risk. And that's what we're doing right now. And I think regular culturing of scopes is one of the ways to try to give grip on the whole situation. Okay, so and you already uh, alluded to this earlier, so your recommendation to prevent these outbreaks also a little bit related to this question that was asked. So obviously monthly testing, mm -hmm. extra testing. Are any other top two or top three things? Well, things that we have been discussing already, it's, yeah. it's investing into the, um, to the uh, education of the hygiene people, the people that clean scopes, R recognize them, give them recognition. Also take them sometimes into an endoscopy room to see 
their product, what they do, to see it in action and what you know, actually is being done with the scope. And in my view, I think um, we, we so much now in this day and age are focusing on technique. And, and you know, when you ask somebody, even my residents or some of my colleagues, if you look at the whole cleaning process, what do you think is the most important step? Everybody will look and will point at the device, the high-level disinfection machine, which is nonsense. The most important step is the manual pre-cleaning. And I find it shocking to see that if there's 25 minutes to be allocated to cleaning, the average time spent is 6.5 minutes. That means that in a majority of cases, you don't give the endoscope the best chance to get cleaned from the high-level disinfection process when it hangs in the dry cabinet. Yeah, thank you. Um, Marion, is there anything you would add when we really talk about when we want to prevent an outbreak, like Professor Bruno talked about, besides the monthly testing of the scopes, the investing in hygiene personnel, and the manual cleaning awareness and giving the time, is there anything else from your point of view that needs to be added to this list that's really critical? Yeah, it's difficult because uh, Marco mentions uh, um, a good points. Uh, the only thing we do in our hospital is, is uh, prevention. So three times a year, all the endoscopes are going back to uh, uh, for for uh, for a survey. So every look at the in internal channels, uh, uh, everything to prevent damage, and 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 that's also a prevention for infection risk yeah, because. We cannot look into the endoscope, um, ha, uh, and we have uh, not a disposable working channel at the moment. So um, ha, we all know a lot of accessories are going through the endoscope and can damage easily uh, the internal channel, uh, and we, we cannot see it from the outside. So it's very important to look inside the endoscope, um, ha, because that can also uh, cause an infection. And, uh, of course, with, with uh, all the tests we are doing, uh, it's what Marco said, the high, we, we, we test the high-risk uh, scopes every month, but not the regular ones. So we have a different uh, uh, policy in that, uh, in, in each hospital, uh, also in the Netherlands. So, uh, yeah, we have a lot of work to do, I think, to make it uh, more standardizing uh, for each hospital. But not only in the Netherlands, but in whole Europe. Yeah, no, I get that, but thanks for that. Um, Professor Le Pelletier, there are a couple of questions for you, um, specifically about the drying part. One of the questions from the UK, for instance, is, is the plasma bag sterile? And if it's not sterile, how do you minimize the risk of contamination from the bag? Um, yes, we, we, we have, Three, uh, um, plus plus uh, uh, three um, devices uh, two to used to 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 dry on the scope and and went to 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 store uh, on, on the scope in, in a in a bag. Um, um, your, your your question is about the, the risk of contamination. No, is the plasma bag dry. sterile? Is it already sterile? The bag. Ah yes, we, we we perform our own uh, test uh, to be sure that uh, we can compare the way of uh, storage between uh, the use of cabinets and the use of bags. And of course, we test the endoscope for each type of endoscope from different uh, units at the time of the storage, and then after a seven-day period of storage to be sure that the uh, um, the, 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 the endoscopy is uh, always uh, sterilized. And we, and we did that, and so it's why we, 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 uh, we used a seven-day period to, to store the, the, um, the endoscope. And, and then in this, uh, since we do that, we reduce the number of uh, uh, cycles per endoscope, for example, in pediatric departments, the uh, gastro, uh, uh, gastroenterology uh, endoscope are not always used for uh, um, a period, for example, and, and we, we can be um, um, uh, obliged to, to treat again uh, a, a pediatric endoscope that had been not used during uh, a week, for example. But before we uh, store uh, endoscope in, in bag, we, 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 we do that uh, every day. So, uh, of course, it's um, uh, a way to, 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 to reduce uh, cycle to be sure 
uh, that's uh, the, the, um, the endoscopy is not uh, uh, contaminated after uh, this period. But some countries uh, reach this time to one month. Okay. And the plasma bag itself, where you put it in, that is already sterile before it goes in, right? Yeah. Um, uh, we, 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 we don't test... Uh, 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 we only test the endoscope, okay. and, not, and, not, and not the bag. We we, we don't reach uh, to this uh, kind of uh, of test. Okay. Currently. Okay. And are there risks in that the bag might be contaminated, or is this uh, not that high? Okay, we got a bit of a lost. Con Sorry. Is it yeah, I don't know. I think we have a bit of a lost connection. I don't know, Paul. Do you have anything to add to that on the on the bag and the contamination of the bag itself? Um, yeah, the bags are not contaminated if you put the endoscope in an aseptic way into the bag, and that is also regarding working like uh, conform the IFU, and uh, that also needs implementation training, training, and. Uh, uh, even with, with the kind of audits that they do it in the right way. And uh, it's an aseptic environment for the endoscope. Uh, and even, yeah, it's always compared with a drying cabinet, but the drying cabinet isn't, isn't sterile also. No. no, and maybe you know there's a question specifically for you, Paul, so I'll just stay with you now. Um, this is from uh, Margaret in Ireland. Um, along with the guidelines, we need to reference the Pentax reprocessing manuals, and these have a global relevance, which sometimes can be in conflict with the national guidelines. What to do? Yeah, I uh, have recognized these questions for, for some time because uh, yeah, we have uh, global guidelines, and for example, there is uh, in the guideline you can sterilize endoscope uh, accessories by ethylene oxide and uh, that is in the US it's okay but in Europe it's not allowed so and when it in, is in the eye of you okay you, people can think well it's allowed also but it's not and uh, we are uh, uh, discuss we are in discussing this issue with uh, with our headquarters in Japan at this moment. Okay, so yeah. this is an ongoing topic. And it's an ongoing topic, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's high on the And issue. that is also the problem, uh, becoming, uh, coming back to the, the, to the uh, guidelines. We have so many guidelines with so many recommendations. So in one region, it's allowed to sterilize them with ethylene oxide. In the other region, it isn't. So, yeah, we have to deal with that. Yeah. Okay, um, there's also a journalist question here, and maybe I can just uh, give that to you, uh, Professor Bruno. Um, we already talked about this briefly, but I think he wants to have a specific answer. How likely do you see the chance for an international regulation, you know, similar to the SGNA guidelines, to become a standard worldwide? So we discussed how we can do it, but how likely do you see the chance that this is going to happen? Not very likely. Not very likely? No, but I think... Um I see now the issue is becoming more and more recognized by professionals in the field. And I think that should be the driving force. You know, in the end, I think there's no doubt that every doctor, every nurse wants to do the best for the patient. Yeah. Um, and once you know that based on scientific evidence, something is good or something is not good, you will do the good and you will try to prevent the bad. Yeah. I think that should be the driving force to uh, have this thing kind of moving forward. Okay. And then the second question from the journalist for you, Paul, is... Um, does Pentax Medical liaise with other manufacturers to address this important topic? Um, do you see, like for instance, the chance for a joint effort with your competitors all together to say this is what we want? I think all the competitors have the, the same goal and the same intent to, to uh, reduce uh, infections, to minimize infection risk and, and to uh, improve patient safety. and. Uh, uh, for example, we are working together in, in, in Germany on an AKE brochure on reprocessing flexible endoscopes. Yeah, that, that is why our competitors also work on, and we are uh, uh, talking with each other on that. Yeah. Okay. Paul, you're a very uh, popular guy, so I'm just going to give this question also to you because it's specifically for you, and then we just have it done now that we're here anyway. So the follow-up question related just now when we had about the manuals and that they're different in different countries, there's a follow-up 
question, comment about that. Now, by recognizing training and certification of the endoscopy HCA who clean the scopes, we are empowering them as a unique part of the endoscopy team. It should be mandatory for all these members of the multidisciplinary team attending training in the structure of the scopes and cleaning of them. Is there anything you want to add to that? Do you agree? Fully agree. Fully agree, okay. Yes. Cool. Uh, Professor Le Pelletier, um, there's another question for you about the plasma typhoon. Um, do we have any testing kit to test the plasma typhoon if there is any ozone gas inside the bag? And how often do you test it? Yeah, we, 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 don't, we don't do that in my, in my center, but probably it's a way to, to, to improve uh, our safety. We only uh, test endoscope and uh, not in a level that uh, Marion, Dr. Professor Bruno uh, said that we are only able to test endoscope once a year. Uh, and of course, every time uh, an endoscope is returning from, from a company of, of the technical services. But we are not currently performing tests uh, inside the connection of the of the plasma uh, typhoon and in the bag, but probably it's uh, uh, a way to to improve our security retroprocessing. Okay, and there's another question for you, Professor Le Pelletier, So I'll just stick with you. Um, before storage inside the plasma bag, how do you ensure and control complete drying of the external surfaces of the endoscope and how critical is this compared to the dryness of the internal endoscope channels? Oh, um, um, we, um, there are two, two, two answers to this question. First of all, the, the external uh, drying of the endoscope and and, and uh, the, the channel uh, drying of endoscope. Uh, of course, we 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 dry the endoscope uh, with the plasma typhoon at the external surfaces. Of course, so we, you 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 can uh, look uh, visually uh, the, the the drying, uh, and then when uh, we have a protocol to be sure um, with the the, the, um, the medical air. To be sure that you you we 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 use the the right methodology uh, for the high level of drying uh, in inside the, the endoscope in, in, in all the channel. So we have no actually we have no tests to be sure that this kind of this type of endoscope is um, uh, drying in a, in a, in a good way. Uh, the um, the only test we perform is to to test with a, a microbiologic sample, the, the, the endoscope. But we have no measure to say that uh, this endoscope is well um, dried. Okay, thanks. Uh, Marion, is there anything you would like to specifically add to the whole topic of um, drying? Because when you fail to dry, you fail to reprocess. Any wise words or thoughts from your end about this step? Um... Now, in the Netherlands, we have um, um, a good regulation for drying, and it's. Um, ha but um, again, that's different uh, in in each country. But uh, definitely, you need to dry an endoscope at least for two hours in a, a good drying cabinet, and after that, uh, uh, um, it's what's already mentioned. Is in some uh, hospitals, you can use the endoscope for seven days uh, with the plasma uh, uh, bag, or um, for instance, in the Netherlands, it's allowed that when you dry the endoscope properly, properly, then you can use the endoscope for 50 days, for instance, um, when you uh, store it in a in a, 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 a dry, not a dry cabinet, but a cabinet uh, who, who, who can, uh, which we, you can close. And uh, so that, that's allowed in the Netherlands. And uh, there is a, a different regulation in each, um, in each hospital, I think. Yeah. yeah. No, I get that. And Professor Bruno, what are your thoughts on that? So we have, you know, hospitals have different thoughts, even countries. Some say 15 days, some say seven days in a plasma bag, some say five hours drying cabinet. I understand that with this new plasma typhoon plasma bag, the complete drying is in five minutes versus, you know, two or three hours in a cleaning cabinet. What, what, what do you think about this whole drying topic? It simply shows we don't have enough science because if we, we, if we would knew, then we would have the right, the right guidelines. I think 
What we do know is that cleaning and, and, and particularly the, the drying process is, is very important. There are still many institutions where the scope is taken out of the, uh, of the high level disinfection process is immediately used in patients because they have a shortage of endoscopes because they don't have enough money to have the basic number of endoscopes to kind of adhere to these kind of uh, protocols of, of, of adequate drying time. Um, I think also with regard to this whole discussion of the plasma typhoon, um, there, there are two, two, two ways to address this topic. First, and I think that's the foremost and most important, you want to avoid biofilm formation from occurring. Because once a scope has a biofilm, you are in big trouble. And you can do whatever you like, but you, you will not tackle the problem adequately. Whether the plasma typhoon is able to deal with the latter, to kind of, you know, get rid of biofilm, I don't know. I kind of doubt it, but I do think that the plasma typhoon has a potential role when you have a new endoscope and you avoid that scope from kind of drying in with all kind of dirt, but you clean it quickly, you make sure there's a continuous uh, rise of, of, of fluid inside the scope, you go through the cleaning process and dry quickly, then I think you take all the steps that are in, kind of in theory needed to prevent biofilm formation from occurring. But what I would like to see is the scientific evidence. Yeah. Professor Le Pelletier, do you have anything to add to that? Because you're kind of a little bit the expert here on drying and uh, biofilm. What are your thoughts on what Professor Bruno just said? Yes, I, I agree with him. That we, we, we are not able to, we, we can only guess that plasma typhoon play uh, a role in the retroprocessing. But we are not uh, able to measure it specifically. Um, uh, so um, maybe if 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 you have a, a, a new park and you are you have sufficient uh, a number uh, of endoscope to 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 perform the, that we can call the the turnover uh, that we, we you you can uh, keep for a, a several hour endoscope in uh, your center to be sure to respect all the the step and not to be uh, pressed by the the, the turnover in the in the unit. So um, typhoon, I, I think it's a good way uh, to 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 be sure that that step, uh, including uh, all the steps, is uh, well performed. Uh, and then uh, you you can guess that uh, if the drying uh, is um, the high level performance the storage will be uh, a high level storage, you know, even if bag or in uh, cabinets, uh, which are equipped with uh, a system to, to dry uh, during all the storage, the, the, the endoscope. So uh, it's just a way to be sure that these steps is, is, is well done. Okay. Paul, as expert here from the industry, what are your thoughts on this drying part, the plasma typhoon, the, the science part, biofilm? What do we need to do yeah, next? We know, we, we know that biofilm is a problem in, in, in flexible endoscopes, and it's also related to the, the first step, which is the very basic and important step, is the manual cleaning, the brushing and the flushing, of course. And when that stage is not performed, conform the eye of view, or during the time required, uh, the biofilm is not brushed away in a correct way. And when the biofilm is not brushed away in, 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 from the channels, it will not be removed by uh, an uh, automated endoscope reprocessor because it's just the flushing of the disinfectant. Uh, and it's always the sciences in, in sterilization and disinfection is always cleaning, disinfection, sterilization. And when you skip the manual cleaning, uh, the disinfection stage uh, will fail. And if you want to sterilize, the sterilization stage fail. And um, I think uh, a quick drying of the endoscope after the reprocessing prevents the formation of a biofilm. Okay. Uh, that's not new. It was already published in 2010 by Yulia Kovaleva, for example. Yeah. Uh, dry environment doesn't allow microorganisms to grow and to, to build up a biofilm. Yeah. And Professor Bruno, is this maybe then, because I think you alluded to it earlier, this is now the transition period in which we are until we get to a completely um, single-use endoscope, right? Right. And which is, you know, there's only one way to 
prevent or to bring the risk to zero with regard to exogenous infections, as I showed in my presentation. That's the use of completely uh, disposable scopes. That's, that's the only for sure way to kind of get to that point. Yeah. In the meantime, we have to deal with the reusable scopes. You, know, you can have a whole lot of discussion about money. You know, what is it worth to, to try to prevent this from happening? And if, there, if we are able with reusable scopes to bring the zero back to 0, 0.00 or something, do we then still need? Yeah. Well, that's another discussion, but the only scientific way to avoid the issue is to use um, a, a reusable scopes. Now, with regard to the biofilm, um, you know, once the biofilm is there, I believe personally that um, it's very difficult to kind of get, get rid of it, kind of brush it away. I think the manual pre-cleaning step is to make sure the scope is clean and to prevent even the occurrence of the biofilm. Um, and sometimes you see a scope being used in an endoscopy suite and it's put aside in a plastic container and before it's even manually cleaned, it stays there for two or three hours or something. That is the worst scenario you can think of with regard to how you then try to kind of you, you promote the mm -hmm. formation of a biofilm. Um, so I think if, once the scope is pulled out in the patient, it has to go as quickly as possible to the disinfection room to get manual pre-cleaning or use some other system to make sure you have continuous irrigation of the channels. Um, because that for me is the only way to try to prevent the formation of biofilm. And then indeed, I fully agree, um, after the whole process, trying as quick, quickly as possible. Yeah. And maybe the plasma typhoon does play a role there. I think from a theoretical point of view, there's good reason yeah. to kind of assume that it might play a role. Uh, but I'm looking forward to the evidence. Yeah, and, I, and Paul, are, are you planning uh, research on this or is... Yes, we are planning research on this, yes. Yeah. Okay, and any deadlines, timelines that you can already share with us here <laughs> no, or is no, that no, a little no, bit, okay. No, not at this moment. Okay, that's a little bit too confidential. Staying with you, Paul, um, we also, you spoke um, quite a bit about uh, training. Um, what would, what would you say that the role of industry as a whole would be regarding this training? Because obviously everybody has his own manual, his own device, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I also heard Marion say, yeah, we have so many different things, et cetera. How, what, what are your thoughts on this? I know you, obviously Pentax Medical find this a very important part because mm -hmm. you organize all these kind of events and are very frank and open about it. But is that something that you would say is within the industry and are you working more together to get coherence around it? Yeah, this? I think so, because we as a manufacturer of the endoscopes, we know the, these devices the best. We know how complex they are. We know how they work. We know how they should be reprocessed. So I think it's our, uh, yeah, it's our goal to, to, to have a role in the training. No, sure, but do you work very closely with, for instance, Marion to even clarify or make your training easier or more comprehensible? Yeah, of course, we are also looking for partners in, in this. Uh, and yes, of course, uh, with, with the guideline developers, yeah, it's, it's very strong to have uh, to, to, to come together with this, yeah. Okay. I think we all have the same goal, uh, we have the same message, and, uh, but we have to think uh, across the borders, and, and that's what is, I think, going to happen. Industry hospitals, uh, but also the guideline developers, the scientific part, yeah, it will all come more and more together. Yeah. Marion, would you have any specific uh, recommendations for industry, what they could do to improve their current guidelines, make it more easier for you and your reprocessing? Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, it's very important to have contact with the uh, manufacturers and um, but it, for Gina, it's also important to are independent uh, for, from the industry, and that's also um, what we have to deal with it. But um, what the manufacturers can do is uh, make it more easy to read the uh, instructions uh, uh, from them their side, uh, because when you look now at the manuals from the from the industry, it's uh, for the people who are responsible for the for the cleaning uh, of the endoscope. Um, it's 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 difficult for them to read, and uh, that's why we uh, make um, uh, make a resume and a short notice of of the of, of the uh, of these papers of these books. But um, it will be really good to make more uh, pointly an instruction for the uh, uh, disinfection uh, staff. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I'm wary of the time and we only have a couple of more minutes. And what I would like to ask um, all the speakers here, and I'll start with Professor Le Pelletier, if you could give maybe one or two key insights or learnings to the audience that you would like to bring across, what is it that you would le really like to emphasize? Professor Le Pelletier. Yeah, um, if, if you are a professional involved in endoscopy activity, uh, you, you must be aware about the improvements in uh, um, techniques, in devices, and you, you can share uh, information with the uh, industry, with your um, uh, infection control team, uh, Etc. So you, you you must be trained, uh, aware about the 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 improvements of the of the devices or, or the, the the process. Um, secondly, to be sure that your your retro processing is um, um, is um, well uh, 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 equipped. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, try to to deal with your direction. To be well equipped in a uh, way to um, to to uh, dis dis disinfect your endoscope with a retro processor, to store your endoscope uh, with plas with a device like plasma bag or with uh, cabinets, uh, and to have um, 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 a system to dry endoscope that is a, a high level uh, a security uh, device. So uh, training in one way and to be well uh, um, uh, organized in uh, another way, uh, maybe in one, one single center in your hospital to make professional the people that are uh, take care of uh, endoscope. Or uh, if you have no uh, one single center in your hospital, uh, uh, keep care to, uh, that all the healthcare workers that involved in the disinfection uh, are well uh, um, uh, equipped uh, in uh, medical units or uh, in ICU or in the operating room. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Professor Le Pelletier, and um, thanks also for being here present today with us. Um, if I may go to Marion, what would your takeaway points be for the audience? Um, I think also for me that's uh, the awareness of the whole team. It's not only uh, the people who are responsible for disinfection of the endoscopes, but also the staff and nurses. So it's, uh, it's uh, awareness, but also uh, training. Uh, that, that's the most important thing uh, we have to realize. But also we ne need more data, and uh, uh, that's, uh, I think, the, the, the things I, I will um, bring uh, it to the people who are attending this um, um, uh, uh, Congress. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and also thank you for taking part in this um, online discussion. Um, if I may go to you, Paul, what would your kind of takeaways be for the audience about the work? Yes, I started my, my slides with first do no harm. And I would say first do train, do educate and make people responsible and build a team on it uh, with the doctors, with the nurses and the reprocessing staff. And of course, we have to make the guidelines more easier uh, to read for, for uh, the reprocessing staff that fully agree with Marion. Uh, but we also have to deal with the medical device guidelines. And uh, yeah, that's also yeah. a little bit difficult, of course. But we, are, we have designed a, a new concept for our eye views with more illustrations and easy to read. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks also for being here and presenting, uh, Paul. And then maybe you can um, end it out, Professor Bruno. What would be your key takeaway messages for the audience? Key takeaway message would be don't be ignorant for the problem. Uh, don't think that you're immune and that only your neighbor hospital uh, deals with this problem because, you know, they don't do it right. Uh, you know, be, be aware that this might happen to you and create an open culture at the endoscopy department, you know, where you have open discussions with staff, with residents, with microbiologists, with your hygiene people, to put this on the agenda regularly. Because that's, you know, that, that's awareness, awareness, awareness. Yeah. 
thank you very much for that, and also thank you for your presentation and contribution here. Um, we're going to round up here. I mean, my own takeaways here were, we discussed four key topics here about the guidelines. I think there, everybody said we need more data, we need more science, we need more research, and then we will take it more serious, and then probably we will make it more acceptable to get to one. And don't forget the amount of time that is needed to make things clean. If we talk about recommendations to prevent an outbreak, I think it was clearly that you need to regularly test those scopes, be it monthly, invest in hygiene personnel, and do not forget the importance of manual cleaning directly after that. And the awareness of that plus enough time should get you more up to speed on that. Um, about the drying part, I think everybody agreed that is absolutely a critical part, the cleaning and the drying. Um, and we could also use a little bit more science there to really know how important it is and what will work, but what won't work. But definitely, it's quite top of mind. And again, as with the guidelines, more science is uh, helpful. And then about the training, I mean, I think all speakers were very clear that that needs to be top um, of mind of everybody. Continuous improvement is really relevant and necessary. Move towards easy to use, better manuals, and of course the awareness of all the staff. Um, I think this wraps it up, and I wanted to thank all the speakers, uh, thank Pentax Medical for organizing this. Of course, thank all the viewers and the listeners also for your questions. We're going to have a 15-minute break, and then after the break, we're going to have a, very, a variety of four breakout sessions after each other, led by Pentax Medical experts. Thanks again, and see you maybe next year. Imagine a world where every single detail is designed to save lives. Where everyone works for the benefit of patient health and comfort, as well as clinical institutions. By delivering cleverly engineered technology and dedicated services to support your fight against diseases, cancer, and infections. A world where you will always find smart and sophisticated answers to your daily challenges. This is the world of Pentax Medical. Welcome to the world of intelligence. Infection prevention is a pivotal element in endoscopy. To minimize the risk of contamination from one procedure to another, Pentax Medical develops innovative solutions that aim to address the main areas of concern in terms of potential infection the elevator, the channels, and the valves, but also optimize drying and storage of the endoscope. The ERCP procedure remains safe and provides clinicians with a significant diagnostic and therapeutic utility for disease evaluation and treatment. However, duodenoscopes have long been recognized as highly complex devices that require thorough reprocessing to properly clean and disinfect. The DEC duodenoscope responds to the need of enhanced patient safety in endoscopy by providing a cost-efficient solution that supports infection control and ensures therapeutic performance. The disposable elevator cap, DEC, not only makes manual cleaning easier for staff, but also eliminates a potential source of infection. As part of our hygiene commitment, Pentax Medical also offers single-use valves and will soon introduce the deck in a hygiene procedure pack combined with core consumables. We have to work with the uh, non-disposable endoscopes, so we have to make sure that we clean them as good as possible in the way that the chance for infection or contamination is as low as possible. The second is to be innovative with regard to the non-disposable scopes in making solutions where we find out where are the biggest problems with these scopes, where we know it's the tip of the scope, we know it's the working channel. So we have to try to come up with innovative solutions to deal with that. The deck is expected to improve infection prevention and reduces the risk by allowing simplified reprocessing with 35% reduction in distal end reprocessing steps due to better access for cleaning and disinfection. Manual pre-cleaning of flexible endoscopes is key to ensuring reliable reprocessing as an end result. 
During endoscopic procedures, endoscopes become heavily contaminated with organic soil and microorganisms, with a risk of biofilm formation if these endoscopes are improperly cleaned, disinfected and dried. Research shows that to create and maintain an endoscope's disinfected status, complete drying is an absolute necessity. Overall, drying and storage are just as important for the prevention of infection as cleaning and high-level disinfection, because complete drying largely reduces bacterial contamination of stored endoscopes. The Plasma Typhoon uses an innovative approach to offer complete drying quickly and efficiently. One to five minutes is all that is needed to completely dry an endoscope. As a result, the endoscope turnaround time can be greatly reduced. After the completion of the drying process, the single-use plasma bag comes into play. Plasma containing ozone molecules is insufflated into the bag, ensuring the dry and disinfected state of the endoscope. Active storage of endoscopes in plasma bag preserves the disinfection state for up to 31 days removing the risk of contamination on storage, therefore ensuring scopes are ready to use at the point of care. Pentax Medical provides innovative solutions to support the treatment of patients that are based on the feedback from the market. We aim to optimize processes to directly tackle patient safety and infection prevention. By offering solutions like the DEC Duodenoscope, single-use consumables, and the Plasma Typhoon and Plasma Bag system, we prove our strong commitment to these vital topics and will continue developing new products, keeping patient safety in mind. Would you like to know more about Pentax Medical's commitment to infection prevention? Read more about our hygiene commitment on our website.